Lesson 58. Numeral Adjectives. Clauses of Characteristic. Caesar Book 1, Chapter 6, Begun. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Lenny's Latin class. Today we're on page 172, and our lesson starts out with a large section on numbers. We have three kinds of numbers to talk about we have cardinal numbers, ordinal numbers, and distributive numbers. And these are all good terms to know. Cardinal numbers are numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, the kinds of numbers that you count with. Ordinal numbers are numbers like 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th. And then distributive numbers, as you can see in the right-hand column, mean things like 1 by 1, 1 each, or 1 at a time. 2 by 2, 2 each, or 2 at a time, and so on and so forth. The word cardinal comes into English from uh, Latin, actually. We have a third declension noun, cardo cardinis. Cardo cardinis, and it means hinge, like the hinge of a door. And so, by extension, the word cardo can also mean other things. For example, it can mean the main street of a town, the main street of a Roman camp. In ancient Jerusalem, there was a big main street called the Cardo. And so a Cardo as a main street is a Cardo in the sense that it's a hinge, a main road that everything sort of hinges on. And since a hinge is the joint that a door pivots on, the door relies on that to work. And so, by extension, the word cardo, hinge, it came to mean uh, something important. So, in English, the word cardinal can also mean important. And in the Catholic Church, a cardinal is a high ranking official. So, you can see the word cardo in Latin, you know, it has its literal meaning of hinge, but then by extension, it means something important that everything else relies on, such as a main street that all the other streets grow out of. The genitive form of cardo is cardinis. You'll find that most of the time when we have an English word that comes from a third declension Latin word, our version of the word comes from the genitive stem, not the nominative form. And cardinal is no exception. Again, the genitive singular form of cardo is cardinis. So again, cardinal numbers are just numerals like one, two, three, four, five. And again, ordinal numbers really aren't even numbers. They're just adjectives that allow you to put things in an order, first, second, third, fourth. That's because the word ordinal, as you might expect, also comes to us from Latin. Another third declension noun, which is ordo, that's O-R-D-O. And as I just mentioned a moment ago, English words that come from third declension nouns tend to come from the genitive stem. The genitive singular form of ordo is ordinus. So that's where we get our English word ordinal from. And the word ordo means things like a row, like in a military formation, a row or a rank or an order. So the word ordo in Latin means order. That's why ordinal numbers are like first, second, third, fourth. They allow you to talk about an order. And the word distributive, well, that also comes from Latin. There's a verb, tribuo, which means to give out, to divide up, and then dis, D-I-S, that prefix means in all directions. So dis plus tribuo means to divide in all directions or give out in all directions. That's literally what that word means, as does our English word distribute. And so that's why distributive numbers mean things like one each, two each, three each. So let's go to the appendix. Appendix section 17, and let's talk a little bit more about numbers. 
It's on page 256. Let's go down each column and talk about what these numbers do. Unas, duo, and tres in the cardinal column, those three numbers are declinable. But once you get to quatuor, from there on, they are no longer declinable. They just stay the same form no matter what. They don't agree morphologically with anything else. Many of these numbers you'll recognize from English words, like uh, number eight, octo, is seen in words like octagon. Also, many of these numbers are in the names of our months. If you add ber to numbers seven through ten, you get the names of our months, like September, October, November, December. That's because September originally was the seventh month of the year. October was originally the eighth month of the year. November, the ninth month, and December, the tenth month. So the numbers of the month are built right into the names. But then they added in two extra months, and so those numbers got bumped up. September went from being the seventh month to the ninth month. October went from 8 to 10, November went from 9 to 11, and December went from 10 to 12. In the number 10, decim, that D-E-C root is also found in other words like decade, which means 10 years. Also, you'll hear these words in music a lot. A duo is a musical group consisting of two people. A trio has three people. A quartet has four. A quintet has five. You'll see that Q-U-I-N root there at the beginning of the number five. A sextet has six. A septet has seven. An octet has eight. A nonet has nine. A dectet has ten. So you'll hear those occasionally in music. If you want to say eleven, you say undecim, which I'm guessing started out as Unus et decim, but through constant use, probably got compacted into undecim. Duodecim is 12, literally 210. It probably started out as 2 and 10. Same thing with tre decim, probably started out as trace et decim. Quatuor decim, queen decim, se decim, 16, probably, I'm guessing, started out as sex et decim but it got alighted and compacted through constant use. Septendecim, the uh, M, turns into an N for ease of pronunciation. And then when you get to 18, you have the number for 20, which is Wiginti, and then it's Duo De Wiginti, literally two from 20. So 18 is literally two from 20. 19 is Unde Wiginti, one from 20. And then 20 is Wiginti, and then 21 is Unus et Wiginti. Moving along, Trigenta is 30, Quadragenta, Quinquaginta is 50. The Hebrew Bible, translated into Greek, is a text known as the Septuagint because traditionally it was supposed to have been translated by 70 Hebrew scholars. And so the Latin word for 70 is Septuaginta, and so it's called the Septuagint, supposedly 70 scholars working on it. Moving along, kentum means 100. We find that C-E-N-T root in lots of English words like percent or a penny is one cent, right? Also words like century, centennial. Moving further down, we have mile, which is a thousand. We've studied that in the book so far. We find that word in English words like millennium. The word millennium means a thousand years, and so it's got mile built into it. The uh, ennium part of the word, that's uh, a corrupted form of the word anus, which means year. Moving along to the ordinal number column, many of these you'll recognize from English words. Primus means first. We have English words like prime and uh, primal, primary. Secundus means second. That's actually where we get our English word second, as in one sixtieth of a minute. 
because dividing an hour into minutes is one division, and then dividing a minute into seconds is a second division. And so those are called seconds because you're dividing it a second time. Also, we have words like secondary. Tertius means third. We have English words like tertiary or tertian. Quartus means fourth. You'll recognize that root in words like quart or quarter, because sometimes these words refer to how many parts something has been divided into. So if something is divided into four parts, then one of those parts is a fourth. And so a quart is one fourth of a gallon. And a quarter is one fourth of a dollar. By the way, the ancient Romans, uh, at least the aristocrats, would name their children often after ordinal numbers. If you were a boy and you were the fifth son to be born, your name might be Quintus, fifth. If you're the sixth, your name might be Sextus. If you're the seventh, your name might be Septimus. Same thing for girls. They might have their father's name in feminine form, followed by some kind of ordinal number. Those of you who have studied music know that eight scale tones, uh, that interval is called an octave because it's a distance of eight scale tones away. Nonus means ninth. Decimus, we see that root in our English word decimal because a decimal divides, you know, in a base 10 math system, it divides one column from the next column, which is one tenth of the value of the column to its left. Undecimus means 11th, duodecimus means 12th. And these uh, words are all adjectives, and they decline like first and second declension adjectives. So if something is the tenth something, it could be decimus, decima, decimum. The tenth legion could be legio decima. The tenth town could be opidum decimum. The fifth man could be vir quintus. Okay, so these are first and second declension adjectives. And you can go on down the rest of the column yourself and see how these convert into ordinal numbers. Moving to the next column of distributive numbers, these really aren't all that common. You don't see them too much. You will see them occasionally. And based on my experience as a reader of Latin, the meaning isn't always consistent. Sometimes it can mean something like two each. Other times it can mean things like two at a time. You just kind of have to keep your eye on the context to figure out exactly what it's communicating. Notice that they all have the letter I at the end, and often in I, like bini, terni, quaterni. In my opinion, more common is the adverbial words, like simel. Simel means once, bis means twice, ter means three times. So these are adverbs talking about how many times something happens. So those are just like once, twice, thrice in English. If you want to get accustomed to numbers in Latin, what I would recommend is doing some counting. You know, each day take five minutes and just count in Latin, unus, duo, tres, quatuor, and so on and so forth, and just go through all the numbers up to a hundred. You know, eventually you'll get to unde triginta, triginta, unus et triginta. Go through the motions and just count through the numbers. And after a while, you'll just start to get the pattern. Same for the ordinal numbers. If you just practice counting through them a little each day, you'll quickly get the feeling for it, and you'll quickly get the pattern. Cardinal numbers are the numbers that you count with, one, two, three, and you can attach those to nouns just like adjectives. Quinque viri, five men. Quatuor feminae, four women. Tria opida, three towns. Remember that unus, duo, and tres are declinable. Starting with quatuor, quinque sex, those are not declinable. Ordinal numbers are numbers like first, second, third, fourth, fifth, because uh, ordinal means order related. Distributive numbers mean like uh, one each, two each, three each, 
or one at a time, two at a time, three at a time. And then the adverbs mean things like once, twice, three times, as in how many times something occurs. So that's a quick introduction to Latin numerals. There's really no secret to doing this. You just need to practice the numbers. If you're really serious about Latin, take some time and practice counting, and that'll help you to get familiar with them. And as I always say, if you speak Latin, you'll use these numbers quite a bit, and that will also help you to get accustomed to them. So let's go back to our lesson now, back to lesson 58. Let's move to section 457. We've actually already covered a lot of this. Ordinals are declined like first and second declension adjectives, like magnus, magna, magnum. The only cardinal numbers that are declined are unus, duo, and tres. And also you may have noticed the numbers above 100. You might want to take some time to study the declension pattern of 1, 2, and 3. That's also good information for you to know. They point you to the appendix, appendix 14. By the way, unus, the numeral one, that's a naughty nine adjective. It declines like a naughty nine because in the genitive singular, it's got I-U-S. So unius. And then in the dative singular, it's got the letter I, not the letter O, which you might expect. Take some time to study the declension patterns for one, two, and three. That's unus, una, unum, duo, and tres tria. Let's move on now to our vocabulary. That's section 458. Our first word is fames, famis, a feminine noun of the third declension. That means hunger. Of course, our English word famine is related to that, or also the word famished. Next, we have tempestas, tempestatis. That's another third declension noun. It's feminine. And it's related to the word for time, which is tempus. So a tempestas can mean, it can mean a season of the year. It can mean the weather in general, or it can actually mean a storm. And in fact, in English, we have the word tempest, like the Shakespeare play. The tempest, which is referring to a storm. Also in English, we have the word tempestuous, which means characterized by strong and turbulent or conflicting emotion, or it can mean stormy. So lots of English words related to tempestas. So as you translate, watch out for that word to mean different things like, you know, a season of the year, weather, or storm. You just have to use the context to figure out what it's saying. Nonaginta is next. It means 90. I'm guessing we'll see that number in our text today in the reading for Caesar's Gallic Wars. Quinginti, Quingenti, Quinginta means 500. In the word Quinginti and other words like it, that G, if you turn it into a C, you get Kenti. So I think that that G there is a remnant of the word kentum. Remember that a G and a C are linguistically the same, only one is voiced and the other is voiceless. So a C is a voiceless G and a G is a voiced C. It could be that the C in kentum got turned into a G by being next to the letter N, which is also voiced. I'm just speculating, but when you think of Quinn Ginty, think of Quinn Kenti, five hundreds. I'm almost positive that's the etymology of it. Next, we have qua. It's really just a form of the relative pronoun. It's an ablative singular form of it. We've talked about this before, how the ablative case is sometimes referred to as the adverbial case because it can tell how action occurs. It can tell by means of what instrument something occurs, uh, with what characteristics something occurs. It can tell the circumstances under which something occurs. And so when you're talking about what kind of characteristics a noun has, that's the job of an adjective. But when you're talking about the kind of characteristics that action has, 
that is adverbial. Adjectives describe or modify nouns. Adverbs describe or modify verbs. They describe action. So the ablative case, as it tends to do, it can describe action. And so in doing so, it takes on an adverbial kind of quality. So sometimes grammarians refer to the ablative case as the adverbial case. And we're seeing that kind of thing here with the word qua as a relative pronoun. It would mean things like by means of which, and that can very easily turn adverbial if it starts to take on a meaning of where. So the point here is that these ablative pronouns, ablative nouns, these can quickly become adverbial and turn into Latin adverbs. Next, we have wix. That's an adverb that means with difficulty or scarcely. Another synonym for weeks would be howd. That's H A U D. Sometimes howd can mean something like a hardly or scarcely. Lastly, we have the verb tolero, tolerare, tolerawi, toleratum. That's a first conjugation verb. It means to endure. Of course, we have our English word tolerate, which is related to tolero. And we have an idiom to keep in mind here, tolero plus the noun famim, which means hunger. That was the first word in our list. That forms an idiom that means to keep from starving. So watch out for that idiom in the text that we'll be reading today. It's probably going to happen in the exercises and maybe even in the reading from Caesar's Gallic Wars. Let's move on to section 459. And let's talk about clauses of characteristic. In a more modern Latin textbook, this would be called a relative clause of characteristic. The textbook we're using here, the first year of Latin, it's over 100 years old. I think it was written probably around the year 1900. So sometimes the names that they call things aren't the same names that we call them today. But anyway, what we would call it today is a relative clause of characteristic. So let's read what they have here. A clause beginning with a relative pronoun, adjective, or adverb is a relative clause. A relative clause which describes or characterizes an antecedent is called a clause of description or characteristic. And so what this is, basically, it's a relative clause with a subjunctive verb. Now, we've seen this kind of thing before. We've seen relative clauses with subjunctive verbs as relative clauses of purpose. So a relative clause of purpose is just like a regular relative clause, but the verb is subjunctive, and it's saying the purpose for which something happens. So this is similar to that in the sense that the verb within the relative clause is subjunctive, but this has a different purpose. The purpose of a relative clause of characteristic, as the name suggests, is to characterize something. So a relative clause of characteristic will tell you the kind of person who would do something or the kind of thing that does this or the kind of thing that does that. So let's look at a couple of examples of them. That's probably the best way to get to know what this kind of phrase does. Let's go to the top of page 174. It says, a common use of the relative clause of characteristic is after such phrases as est, qui, or sunt qui. So let's look at example sentence one. Sunt multi qui decant. And it means there are many who say, first of all, let me point out that when you see est or sunt at the beginning of a sentence, when it comes first, it's often translated as there is or there are. And that's what's happening here. The word sunt is the first word in the sentence. So starting out with the word sunt, we'll start out our translation with there are. 
And then multi is a substantive adjective. That means many, but it means many people. So you have to supply the word people or not because uh, it makes sense in English to say there are many who say in English when you say that, you know that it's referring to people. So you don't really have to supply the word people, but you can if you want to. My point here is that multi is a substantive. Now on to the really important part, which pertains to this lesson. That's qui decant. That is a relative clause. Qui is a relative pronoun that starts out the relative clause. Notice that decant is subjunctive. That's the verb deco, which means say. Deco is a third conjugation verb. So deco, dicere. If it were indicative, it would be decunt. But instead, we have an A there instead of the U. So it's decant and it's subjunctive. So what's the difference between having the verb deco here as indicative or subjunctive? Okay, here's the difference, and you can read this in the paragraph below. It says, sentence one means, there are many of the kind that say, not many who actually say. The latter would require the indicative qui decunt. So if it were indicative, like sunt multi qui decunt, that would be, there are many people who actually say, many actual people actually saying something. But with the subjunctive verb, decant, it's saying that there are many of the kind of people that say something. So by having the verb in the relative clause be subjunctive, it gives it a different shade of meaning. It's called a relative clause of characteristic because it's characterizing the people being talked about. Whatever is being referred to by the antecedent, the relative clause characterizes them. So it's got sort of a generalized kind of characterization of someone. It's not actual people saying actual things. It's saying that there are the kind of people. And so it's appropriate that this kind of clause would have a subjunctive verb because, you know, the indicative talks about real action. And so since this is action that expresses some kind of characteristic, it's not exactly a real action. So for that kind of thing, that's really exactly the kind of thing that the subjunctive does. So it's appropriate that the subjunctive would be used in this kind of clause in Latin. Moving on to number two, erant itinera duo quibus itineribus. Helvetii domo exire posent. Again, errant coming first in the sentence, we can translate it as there were. And then itinera duo, those two words go together. It means two roads. And then quibus itineribus, that means by means of which roads. It's a little bit repetitive. We have a uh, itineribus there, when we really don't need it, the sentence would mean just the same thing without itineribus. As you can see, there's a footnote that says the antecedent of a relative is sometimes repeated in the relative clause. And in fact, in Julius Caesar, I've seen this before, sometimes Julius Caesar will actually put the antecedent inside the relative clause. Like, for example, here in number two, instead of having itinera twice, errant itinera duo, quibus itineribus, Caesar will actually sometimes leave out the first one. And so what used to be the antecedent now is actually parked inside the relative clause. So that's kind of a weird thing that you will see occasionally in Julius Caesar. But I digress. That's not really what we're talking about right now. So what we have so far is there were two roads by means of which roads 
the Helwete E, posent, that means we're able. Exire is exeo, that's the verb ex plus eo, which means to go out. And then domo means from home, that's ablative of separation. So there were two roads by means of which roads the Helwete E could or were able to go out from home. So in number two, if the relative clause had an indicative verb, like potuerunt or something like that, then that would be talking about actual roads that they could actually go on. But with a subjunctive verb here in the relative clause, it's a relative clause of characteristic. And it's saying that those are the kinds of roads that they could take. As far as the relative clause goes, itinera is the antecedent, and then quibus is the relative pronoun that kicks off the relative clause. Quibus is neuter because its antecedent itinera is neuter. It's plural because its antecedent itinera is plural, but it's ablative because of the role it plays in the relative clause. The role it plays is that of ablative of means. So by means of which, that's what quibus is doing here. So there were two roads by means of which the Helwetii could go out from home. Remember that a relative pronoun that starts out a relative clause can be in any case, and it can be doing anything. You just have to keep your eye on what case it is and understand the role that it's playing in the relative clause. And I've tried to train you throughout this lecture series. I've tried to train you to do that by always pointing out how it connects to the antecedent and how it connects to the clause that it's in. So hopefully you've gotten the idea by now of how to do that. So quick review, we're talking about relative clauses of characteristic. Here in this book, they just call them clauses of characteristic. In a more modern Latin book, they would probably have the heading relative clauses of characteristic. So that's what the term is for it today in Latin instruction. And relative clauses of characteristic are relative clauses in which the verb is subjunctive and it characterizes what kind of thing or person the antecedent is. That's why it's called a clause of characteristic because it characterizes. It says what kind of person or what kind of thing the antecedent is. Let's move on now to section 460. That's our translation section for this lesson. Go ahead and turn off the recording and do all the exercises except number eight. And when you're finished, turn the recording back on and we'll go over them together. Okay, hopefully by now you've completed your homework. Let's go over the exercises here in section 460, starting with number one. Number one says, quinque dies. Quinque is a cardinal number. That means uh, numbers like one, two, three, four, five. And it's here along with the word dies, which means days. So number one says five days. And since dies is fifth declension, really this could be accusative plural. Uh, You know, so it could be nominative plural or accusative plural, same ending. And so if it's accusative, it really could be uh, accusative of extent of time. So it could mean for an extent of five days or for five days. Keep in mind that the cardinal numbers, starting with four and going upward, are indeclinable. In number two, quintus dies, we also have the number five, but in a different form. Here, it's an ordinal number. Ordinal numbers are numbers like first, second, third, fourth, fifth. They're really adjectives. They decline like first and second declension adjectives. And so quintus means fifth. And that's a masculine form. Strangely, the word dies, which means day, that's a fifth declension noun, by the way. That word can 
be masculine sometimes and feminine other times. Uh, in this particular case, they're treating it as masculine. And since quintus, an ordinal number, which is really an adjective, since it's an adjective here, it has to agree with dies. In number three, dia septimo, we have an ablative of time when. Dia is the word dies, which means day, and it's ablative singular. Again, that's a fifth declension noun. Other fifth declension nouns you know would be nouns like reis, and we may have seen the word uh, fides. Also the word space, S-P-E-S, which means hope. I think that's also fifth declension. Space, reis, dies, fides. Those are the only four I can think of right off the top of my head. But again, those are fifth declension. DA is ablative singular, and septimo is the ordinal number, septimus, septima, septimum, which means seventh. Again, it declines like a first and second declension adjective, and so to be ablative along with DA, it becomes septimo. Again, they're treating DA here as masculine. And the way it's been explained to me in the past is that Dies is masculine when it's just talking about a day in general. But if it's talking about a specific day, like a holiday perhaps, it can be in the feminine. So just keep your eye out for that. It can be masculine or feminine. The fifth declension noun, dies. Moving on to number four, quatuor pagi. Quatuor is a cardinal number that means four. And it's modifying pagi. That's the noun pagus, which means district. So number four says four districts. Again, quatuor is indeclinable. Moving on to number five, ad numerum quatuor milium. We've seen that with numbers, the preposition ad can mean something like about. And it's taking the accusative here, as it always does. So ad numerum means something like about the number, and then quatuor means four, and milium means thousands. It's genitive plural. So literally, that would give us four of thousands. So number five says about the number 4,000. I think milium is genitive because it's a partitive genitive. It's four of thousands. Number six is next, ab quingentis equitibus. Equitibus is the third declension noun equites, which means cavalrymen. That is a, a soldier who goes into battle riding a horse. It's ablative plural. It looks like, along with the preposition ab, it looks like it's an ablative of agent. For example, if you had some passive verb, you know, like, uh, the enemy is being attacked, then you could have ab equitibus. It's being attacked by the cavalrymen. Oftentimes with a passive verb, you'll have an ablative of agent with the preposition a or ab, and equitibus is being modified by quingentis. The queen here means five. Let's break down the word quingentis. The queen means five. And gentis, that G there, I'm pretty sure, started out as a C. Kentis in the sense of hundreds. So queen plus kentum would be 500. And then I think due to linguistics, the C and kentum got turned into a G. I'm guessing because it's next to the letter N, which is voiced. So the voiceless letter C became voiced. It turned into a G to match the N. That's just my guess. I can't prove it. Not sure, but I think that's what happened. Notice also that quingentis is declined. So ab here is taking the ablative, and so we do have an ablative plural ending on quingentis. It's not just an indeclinable number like five or seven or eight. So ablative plural ending there on quingentis and on equitibus. So, number six, 
could be an ablative of agent saying, buy 500 cavalrymen. Number seven is next. Milites decimi legionis. Milites means soldiers. That's a third declension noun. Nominative plural. Legionis is genitive singular. That's possessing the soldiers. It's the soldiers of the legion. Legio is feminine, as are pretty much all the third declension nouns that end in I-O. Legio, oratio, natio, editio. All those third declension nouns that end in I-O. They're all feminine, to my knowledge. So legionis is genitive singular feminine, and it's got decami, also with a genitive singular feminine ending, modifying it. That's the ordinal number, decimus, decima, decimum, which means tenth. So decami legionis says of the tenth legion. And so number seven says soldiers of the tenth legion. Let's skip over number eight and go to number nine. Cum duabus legionibus. When you have the preposition cum and it just means with, you're saying that somebody is with someone, we call that the ablative of accompaniment. You're just saying simply that someone is with someone. I went to the coffee shop with my friend. I went to the store with Fred. I went to the park with Sheila. That's all it is. It's just you're saying someone's with someone. And that's what we have here. Duabus legionibus, those are ablative because cum takes the ablative. Duabus means two. And so cum duabus legionibus says with two legions. Number 10 is next. Erat unum iter qua vix singuli cari ducerentur. When you see a verb of being come first in a sentence, especially a third-person one, like est, sunt, erat, you can often translate it with the word there. You can say there is, there are. In this case, erat, you can say there was. So keep your eye out for verbs like that coming first in a sentence. And that's what we have here. So let's translate erat as there was. And then we have iter, which means road, march, way, path, journey, trip, things like that. Here it means root or road. And iter is neuter. In the nominative plural, it would be etenera. So unum iter says one road. Since iter is neuter, unum has a neuter ending. There was one road. That's how it starts out. And then qua, we studied that earlier. You could think of it as a relative pronoun, by means of which or by which. Here in this lesson, they present it as adverbial. It doesn't really matter how you think of it. The meaning is going to be the same anyway. As I've mentioned several times, the ablative case in Latin is often referred to as the adverbial case because the way that the ablative case is deployed oftentimes is done in such a way that it describes action or activity or circumstances. So it very easily becomes adverbial. So we'll translate qua as by which or by means of which. Really, it's an ablative singular relative pronoun. But here's another thing to think about. If it were really just a relative pronoun, according to the rules of Latin grammar, really it would be quo. Why? Because iter is neuter. And remember the rule that I've taught you all this time. A relative pronoun agrees with its antecedent in number and gender, but not in case. It gets its case from the job it's doing within the relative clause. So if we were looking at the word qua strictly as a relative pronoun, really it ought to be quo, because that would be the neuter form of the relative pronoun. But here we have qua. Let's go back up a minute to the vocabulary and read the section on qua in the right-hand column. That's uh, section 458. It says qua 
relative adverb by which or where. So this word probably started out as a relative pronoun, but it apparently has been adverbialized. It's been somehow turned into an adverb that gets used in lots of different situations. So it has ceased to be a relative pronoun and has taken on a life of its own as an adverb. And so since it's really an adverb now, moving back to exercise 10, since it's really an adverb now and technically not a relative pronoun, it doesn't have to agree with iter. So at first glance, we would look at this and say, oh, qua is starting a relative clause. And it is, in a sense, but it's doing it as an adverb. So qua is a relative adverb, and we'll translate it as by means of which, or simply by which. And then we have a new clause here, a relative clause, with kari as the subject. Kari means carts. That's the second declension noun, karus, C-A-R-R-U-S. Kari means carts. And dukerentur, that is the verb duco, which means to lead. Notice that we have a subjunctive verb here. Keep that in mind for a moment. The verb is subjunctive, and it's imperfect subjunctive, third person plural. So what we have is carts that are being led along. Probably a good way to translate it is draw, to pull or draw a cart. What we have so far would say, there was one road by which carts might be drawn or pulled. Wix is an adverb that means scarcely or with difficulty. And singuli is a distributive number that means one at a time. Basically, the sentence says, there was one road by which carts were drawn scarcely one at a time. But with our verb here being a subjunctive verb, there's something else to be drawn out of this. And that is that this is probably a relative clause of characteristic. When you have a relative clause with a subjunctive verb, to my knowledge, it can be either a relative clause of purpose or a relative clause of characteristic. The relative clause of characteristic is one of our new grammar items for this lesson. So probably they're giving it to us here to practice because they just taught that to us in this lesson. So let's try to translate number 10 just for practice. Let's try it in each of its two possibilities. With a relative clause that has a subjunctive verb, it can be a relative clause of purpose or a relative clause of characteristic. So let's try both just for fun and see how it turns out. Let's try it as a relative clause of purpose. There was one road by which, for the purpose of, carts could be pulled. See, that doesn't really make any sense. In fact, all the relative clauses of purpose that I've seen have a relative pronoun in the nominative because they're going to go do something. So this does not work as a relative clause of purpose. Let's try it as a relative clause of characteristic. There was one road by which, or there was one road, the kind of which, the, the kind of road by which carts might be drawn scarcely one at a time, or with difficulty one at a time. Now that makes more sense. The relative clause here is characterizing the kind of road. It's the kind of road that is so slender or so narrow that you can scarcely get carts through it one at a time. So putting it all together, we could say there was one road, the kind of which road, by which carts scarcely one at a time were drawn along. It's hard to pack it all in. It's hard to get it all in in the English, but that's what the Latin is communicating. It's a relative clause of characteristic. Number 11 is next. Diem dicunt qua die ad ripam rodani omnes conveniant. 
We have a few things here to unpack. Let's start with DM Dekunt. Here we have the word for day, that's deace, in the accusative singular. It's the direct object of dekunt. That's the verb deco, which means to say. But as you can see from footnote number four, here it means something like to a point. We don't have an explicitly stated subject. We don't know who the they is. So decunt says they appoint, and then diem means day. So they appoint a day, and then we have a footnote number five next to qua. Before, when we saw qua, that was a relative adverb. Here it seems, well, they're calling it a relative adjective. I don't really want to split hairs about that right now. So just think of it as a relative pronoun. It's going to be ablative of time when. So qua plus da here, they're treating deace as feminine. So we'll say qua da will mean upon which day or on which day. I mentioned a moment ago that the fifth declension noun deace, which means day, can be feminine or masculine depending on the context. I mentioned that when they talk about a day as a specially appointed time, it can be feminine. And it looks like that's what's happening here. So it says, they appoint a day on which day blah, blah, blah happens. Okay, so that's the structure of it. And yes, it's a little bit repetitive because they're repeating the word dies dm at the beginning, and then da again with qua. And I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again, that sometimes Julius Caesar will do this. He'll have the antecedent repeated within the relative clause, like you see here with qua da, but then he'll actually leave out the first incidence of the antecedent. Imagine, for example, here, if the word dm were not there. And it was just, they appoint upon which day, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes Caesar will do that. He'll omit the antecedent and he'll plug it in into the relative clause, agreeing with the relative pronoun. Why does he do that? I don't know. It's just a thing that he occasionally does. And I think that the authors of the book are giving us some exercises here with a repeated antecedent to uh, sort of train us to keep our eye out for that kind of thing. I'm not sure that that's what they're doing, but I think they're doing that. They're trying to repeat those antecedents within the relative clause to help us get the feel of it, thus making it easier to recognize if Caesar does actually leave out the main first antecedent. And if that happens, I'll point it out to you. But in the meantime, what we have is a repeated antecedent. So they appoint a day upon which day blah, blah, blah happens. That's the structure. Qua and da are ablative of time when. Qua, the relative pronoun, is agreeing with its antecedent, which is dm. It's singular because dm is singular. It's feminine because dm is feminine but it's ablative because of the role it's playing in the relative clause. Within the relative clause, it's playing the role of ablative of time when. So in number 10, qua was a relative adverb, not agreeing with iter. It's qua, not quo. But then here in number 11, qua actually is a real ablative relative pronoun. And actually, now that I think about it, now I understand why the authors of the book are calling it a relative adjective, because really it's modifying DA. So technically speaking, with DA there being repeated, yes, it makes qua into an adjective, technically speaking. But just for your understanding, just think of qua as a relative pronoun. It's unusual to have the antecedent repeated inside the relative clause like this. So yes, technically, that does turn qua into a relative uh, adjective. Moving into the relative clause here, we have the verb conveniant. That's the verb 
winio, which means come, prefixed with the preposition con. Con means together or with. And so con and winio together say come together in the sense of assemble or gather. They appoint a day upon which day they assemble. We don't know who the they is. There's no explicitly stated subject here. We do have omnes, which is a substantive adjective. So that means everyone or everybody. And then ad ripam rodani. Ripa means bank, like the bank of a river or stream. And ad means at. And then rodani, that's referring to the Rhone River, one of the rivers in France. And so Ad Ripam Rodani says, at the bank of the Rhone. So number 11 says, they appoint a day on which day everyone would gather at the bank of the Rhone. One last thing to deal with here, that's the fact that conveniat is subjunctive. So that could make this a relative clause of characteristic. So they could be using this relative clause of characteristic to characterize the kind of day they're trying to set up. So it could be saying something like, they appoint a day, the kind of day upon which everyone would gather at the bank of the Rhone. That's about the most sense I can make of it. It's uh, apparently a relative clause of characteristic. Number 12 is next. Domi nihil erat, quo famem tolerarent. The subject here is nihil, the verb is erat. So that says nothing was, or perhaps we could say there was nothing. And then domi, that's one of those special locative forms that means at home. So the first three words say something like at home, nothing was, or at home, there was nothing. Then we have a relative clause of characteristic. Quo is the relative pronoun starting the relative clause. It's referring back to the antecedent nihil. And so quo means something like by means of which or by which. And then famem tolerarent. We saw that earlier in the vocabulary. Tolero means to endure. But with famem, which means hunger, they told us that it's an idiom that means something like to stave off starvation or to prevent starvation, to prevent starving. So it's third person plural. So it's they keep from starving. That's kind of how we can translate famem tolerarent. With famem and tolerarent being a relative clause of characteristic, Number 12 might say something like this. At home, there was nothing, the kind of thing which, by means of which, they would keep from starving. That was very clunky, but that's what it's saying. So to cram it all in to an English translation, we might say, at home, there was nothing of the kind by which they could keep from starving. Again, it's clunky, but that's what the Latin is communicating. Number 13 is next. Tempestas idonea ad navigandum. Tempestas is a, well, it's one of our new words for this lesson. It's a third declension noun that can mean weather, season, storm. Here it seems to mean weather. The adjective idoneus, idonea, idoneum means suitable. Tempestas and idonea together, that says suitable weather. And then we have a gerund, ad plus nawagandum. Ad means for the purpose of. And then nawagandum is a gerund of the verb nawago, which means sail. We get our English word navigate from it. So ad nawagandum means for the purpose of sailing. Again, nawagandam is a gerund in the accusative case, expressing purpose along with the preposition odd here. So number 13 says something like, weather suitable for the purpose of sailing. Or more colloquially, 
suitable weather for sailing, something like that. It's not even really a complete sentence. It's just sort of a sentence fragment for practice. Number 14 is next. Akadit ut essent magnae tempestates. Akadit is one of those impersonal verbs that we studied recently. It means something like it occurs or it happens. Here it looks like it's perfect tense. So it's something like it happened or it so happened. Then we have an ut clause with a subjunctive verb. Essent is there was or there were, rather. Magnae tempestates. Here, the noun tempestas means storm. In number 13, it meant weather. Here, it means more like uh, storms. And so, magnae tempestates says great storms. So, number 14 says, it happened that there were great storms. So, in number 14, we have an ud clause with a subjunctive verb with an impersonal verb. That's, that's what's going on there. In number 15, secutae sunt tempestates, quae nostros in castris contenerent. In number 15, the noun tempestas again means storm. So tempestates means storms, and that's the subject of the sentence. Secutae sunt, that's a form of the verb sequor, which means follow. Notice that secutae sunt is a gendered verb. The third declension noun tempestas is grammatically feminine. And so secutai sunt, that participle there, secutai, needs to be feminine too to match the grammatical gender of tempestates. Secutai sunt is perfect tense. So what we have so far says the storms followed, or just simply storms followed. Then we have a relative clause. Quai is the relative pronoun that starts out the relative clause. The antecedent is tempestates. So quai is feminine because its antecedent tempestates is feminine. It's plural because the antecedent is plural, but it's nominative because of the role it plays in the relative clause. In the relative clause, quai is the subject. The verb is contenerent. That's the verb conteneo which means to hold someone in, to keep back, to hem in, to restrain, something like that. In castris says in the camp. Castris is always plural, so that's a, an ablative plural ending there. So what we have so far would say storms followed, which kept in or restrained in the camp. And what did they restrain or keep in? Nostros. Nostros is an adjective that means our, O-U-R, and nostros is a substantive. So literally it says, which kept our in the camp. So you have to supply a word like our men, our soldiers, our troops. In our English translation, let's throw in the word soldiers. So storms followed, which kept our soldiers in the camp. One last thing, though, contenerent is subjunctive. So this is probably a relative clause of characteristic. They're characterizing the kind of storms that there were. Here's a clunky translation, but the idea is storms followed the kind of storms which would keep our soldiers in the camp. So seeing as how we have a relative clause of characteristic here. Number 15 could say something like this. Storms followed the kind of storms which kept our soldiers in the camp. Number 16 is next. Eorum qui arma ferre possent fuit numerus milium non agenta duorum. We have a main clause here and a relative clause. In the main clause, Numerus is the subject, and fuit is the verb. So we could say the number was, fuit is perfect tense, or we could say perhaps there was a number. Either way, 
the number is the subject and fuit is the verb. The idea that there was a number or a number was. Aorum is a genitive plural form of is a id. So it means of those or of them. And then we have a relative clause. Qui arma ferre posent. Qui is the relative pronoun. It's masculine and plural because its antecedent, aorum, is masculine and plural. But it's nominative because of the role it plays in the relative clause. It's the subject of the relative clause. So posent means to be able, right? That's an imperfect subjunctive form of posum. And then ferre means to bear. That's the present infinitive form of pharaoh. And then the direct object is arma, which means arms or weapons. So qui arma ferre posent says who were able to bear arms. So the first part of the sentence says of those who were able to bear arms. Then after that, the number was, and then it tells us the number. So this sentence is saying how many people there were who could fight, how many people could bear arms and form an army. The word nonagenta means 90. And then we have milium, which is the word for thousand, but it's in the genitive plural. What it looks like to me is that milium here is being declined because it's declinable. Nonagenta is also genitive plural, but it is indeclinable, so it doesn't look genitive plural. And then duorum, that's the number two, which also is declinable, so that's genitive plural too. So milium, nonagenta, and duorum are all three genitive plural. But you can only tell with milium and duorum because those two are the two that are declinable, whereas nonagenta is an indeclinable number. So if you add it all up, it's nonagenta and duo. That's 92 thousands. It seems as though, according to the footnote, that this is all genitive because it's agreeing with aorum. So these numbers here, to me, they do not seem to be representing some kind of partitive genitive. It's just a straight number that happens to be agreeing with aorum. Also, the fact that the verb is subjunctive in the relative clause, to me that points to a relative clause of characteristic. So it's saying, of those, that is the kind of people who could bear arms, that kind of person, there was 92,000 of them. Simply put, number 16 translates like this. Of those, the kind of people who were able to bear arms, the number was 92,000. Let's move on now to section 462. This is the first part of chapter 6 of book 1 of Caesar's Gallic Wars. And they have a helpful map here in the textbook. Also on the Lenny's Latin Class website, I have a page called Study Helps, and that contains several helpful maps that I have selected, which can help you understand what's going on here. In a nutshell, the Helvetii, we already know that they are trying to plan a big exodus out of their homeland. And as part of that plan, they would like to take a shortcut. Unfortunately, that shortcut involves cutting across Roman territory. Who is in charge of Roman Gaul right now? Julius Caesar. And does Julius Caesar want a huge nation to cut across Roman territory? No. He does not want them to cut across because he sees that as potentially troublesome. He thinks that the Helvetii could cause problems and perhaps steal stuff or raid farms. There's also the issue that about 50 years or so before this, the Romans had had a conflict with the Helvetii, and a well-known Roman had been killed by the Helvetii. So you could say that Julius Caesar is holding a grudge against the Helvetii. 
So first of all, he doesn't want the Helvetii cutting across Roman territory. And secondly, he's holding a grudge for this thing that happened, you know, 50 some odd years ago. So in a nutshell, the Helvetii want to take a shortcut across Roman territory, but Caesar does not let them do it. Disaster ensues and there's a huge conflict. That's basically what happens. If you want to see specifically where the Helvetii wanted to cut through, take a look at the maps on the Study Helps page of the Lenny's Latin Class website. And if you do that, it'll help you to understand more of the specifics of, you know, the geography of what exactly they were trying to accomplish, the actual route of their shortcut or planned shortcut. So let's start reading here in section 462. Again, this is the beginning of chapter 6 in book 1. Errant omnino itinera duo, quibus itineribus, domo exire posint. As I mentioned before, when a verb of being in the third person comes first in a sentence, you can translate it oftentimes with the word there, there is, there are, there were, there was. And that's what we have here. Errant is saying something like, there were. And then we have itinera duo. That means two routes or two roads. And omnino, you can see it's related to the word omnis, which means all. So omnino says something like all together or in total or in all. So there were in total or in all. Two roots. Now we have a relative clause starting with quibus. It's a relative clause of characteristic. We have a repeated antecedent. The word for road or root, that's iter, is repeated. So we have duo itinera and then quibus itineribus. So there were in all two roots or two roads by means of which roots. Posent exire, they were able to go out. And then domo is ablative of separation. It means from home. Notice that the word posent is subjunctive. So this relative clause here is a relative clause of characteristic. So it's saying there were in all two roots, the kinds of roots by which they could go out from home. So it's characterizing with a relative clause of characteristic. It's characterizing the kinds of roads that they're talking about. So there were two roads, the kinds of roads that by means of which they could go out from their home. And then next we have unum per sequanos. That means one through the sequani. That's a tribe in Gaul known as the sequani. And angustum et difficile, that means narrow and difficult. Notice that unum, angustum, and difficile are all neuter because they're referring back to an iter. Iter is a third declension neuter noun. So when they say unum per sequanos, it's understood that you're referring to an iter, which is grammatically neuter. So that's why it's not unus or una, it's unum, because we have in mind the idea of an iter, which is grammatically neuter. So one, meaning one road, one through the sequani, narrow and difficult. And then we have a prepositional phrase, inter montem iuram et flumen rodanum. Inter means between. Montem means mountain, flumen means river. So it's saying between mountain and river. And it gives us the names. Yura is the name of the mountain. Rodanum, which is the Rhone River, that's the name of the river. So inter montem Yuram says between Mount Yura. And then et flumen Rodanum says and the Rhone River. Next, it says wix qua singuli cari. Ducerentur. We saw that exact phrasing in an exercise a few minutes ago. Wix means scarcely or with difficulty. Ducerentur means to lead. That's a duco. 
It's imperfect subjunctive, third person plural, passive. So that's uh, might be led or might be drawn if it's a cart. Kari means carts. Singuli means one at a time. Qua is a relative adverb. It means by means of which or by which. So this whole section, it's really not too difficult. It says one, meaning one route or road, one through the Sequani, narrow and difficult, between Mount Yura and the Rhone River, by which scarcely carts were drawn one at a time. That's a relative clause of characteristic. So it's saying the kind of road on which you could scarcely pull carts through one at a time. In other words, it's so narrow, you can barely even squeeze one cart through it. So it's a narrow, difficult passage. So to help us understand the geography and, well, really just the plot of what's happening here, let's take a look at a map. So go to the Linney's Latin Class website and click on Study Helps. And let's take a look at the third map. The third map there is a colorful one, mainly pink. You can see where I've colored in a couple of paths there. In fact, uh, in your browser, you might want to click on the image and zoom in a little bit. You'll see where I've made some blue dots and some green dots. As far as I can tell, the blue dots represent the difficult route, uh, the one we just read about. To the northeast of the blue dots, you'll see a big lake. I think uh, in modern terms, that's called Lake Geneva. And then it's apparently in kind of a valley. It's in a low-lying area. And then just to the west is the mountain range known as the Jura Mountains. Uh, in the Latin text, it's just called Mount Jura. It's really more of a mountain range, as you can see on the map. Mons is singular, but it's really kind of a mountain range. So imagine you're a traveler traveling on foot, and you want to go on that blue path. And by the way, if you want an even closer look, you can use Google Maps. Google Maps is great because you can zoom in as much as you want. If you look closely at the blue dots that I put there, you'll see it's right next to a river. And so that river that is flowing southwest out of Lake Geneva, that is the Rhone River. Just on the west side of the Rhone River, where the blue dots are, on that same side, that's Mount Jura. So those blue dots represent the path or the trail that they want to take. So those blue dots there, that represents the trail that is being referred to here. In the Latin text, it says it's uh, narrow, it's difficult, it's between Mount Jura and the Rhone River. So if you look carefully, you'll see that those blue dots on the west side of the river, or really the north side of the river, the mountain range, you know, the foot of the mountain comes right down to the river. That trail or road is right on the edge of the river, and it's probably sloped, you know, like uh, you'd be walking on sort of a cambered road. The word camber means when a road is not completely level, left to right. And according to Julius Caesar, it's very narrow. So you're squished between a river and a big mountain. And so that's why that road is hard to travel on. That's geographically why it's difficult to travel on. That's one of the two roads they have access to. That's the first one. It's narrow. It's difficult. It's hard to get carts through. It's squished in between a big mountain and a river. Not the most desirable travel itinerary. By the way, itinerary comes from the Latin word iter. Moving on to the next line, it says, Mons altum altissimus impendebat. So mons means mountain, and impendebat is imperfect tense, and that's impendo, which means to hang over. Mons and impendebat, it says that a mountain was overhanging. 
And Altissimus, uh, it's a very high mountain. Altissimus is a uh, superlative adjective here, modifying mons. Mons is masculine, so Altissimus is masculine. The authors of the book want us to translate autem as besides. Like, besides that, or in addition, or something like, furthermore. Okay, so this route is difficult, it's narrow, and autem, besides all that, a mons altissimus, a very high mountain, impendebat, was overhanging. If you're walking along right next to a very high mountain, in a sense, it's sort of hanging over you, right? It's sort of up there right above you. Okay, so besides that, a very high mountain was overhanging. With this mountain overhanging, that implied a military advantage to someone who might want to prevent people from traveling on that road. So we have an ut clause here, ut facile per pauci prohibere posent. I think this is a result clause. They're saying with this mountain hanging over you, the result was that per pauci posent. Per pauci means very few. Pauci is the first and second declension adjective, paucus, pauca, paucum. We have our English word paucity that comes from that. Paucity means uh, something like scantiness. Pauci means few, and then per is intensifying or strengthening the meaning of pauci. So it's not just few, it's per pauci, very few. And then posent means they were able, and then prohibere means to prevent, to stop, to hold off, something like that. And then facile says easily. You know, this isn't exactly the way we've seen result clauses before. We've seen result clauses usually with words like tom, T-A-M. The mountain was so high that blah, blah, blah. Nevertheless, I would say that this is similar to a result clause because talking about the high mountain basically is setting up a, a situation. It's almost as if you're saying the mountain was so high that blah, blah, blah. So this feels to me like a result clause. And so that's why we have ut plus a subjunctive. Besides that, a very high mountain was overhanging with the result that per pauci, very few were able to easily prevent or stop. And who can they stop? The people trying to travel on that road. That's implied here. So they can easily stop or prevent travelers or people trying to go along that route. Moving on, now we're going to learn about the other road. Remember, there are two roads being talked about here. Earlier it says, Errant etinera duo. There were two roads. So Caesar has described to us the first one, which is that really difficult one on the north side of the Rhone between the river and the mountain. Now he's going to tell us about the other one, which I think is more desirable. Alterum means the other. That's the adjective alter, which means other. That's a naughty nine adjective. It's neuter here because, again, the word iter from the third declension is a neuter noun. And so alterum is referring to the unspoken idea of the iter, the neuter noun iter. If you want, you can think of the word iter after alterum. You can write it in if you want. Alterum iter, the other route or the other road. And then per provinciam nostrum. That says through our province. The Romans by this time in history had already established themselves in the south of France, what was called Gaul. And they have a big province there, which in Latin they called Provincia. I think formerly it had been called something like uh, Gallia Narbonensis. There's a big city there called Narbo. Today, that city is called Narbonne, N-A-R-B-O-N-N-E. So according to an online encyclopedia, it's saying 
Narbonne was established in Gaul by the Roman Republic in 118 BC. So the time period we're referring to here in Caesar's Gallic Wars is, I believe, uh, 58 BC. By this time, the province in southern Gaul had been established by the Romans for 40, 50, 60 years. So the Proincia, the province in southern Gaul, is a Roman province, and it's been established for quite a while. So that's the Proincium here. We're at the top of page 176. When it says Per Proincium Nostrum, that's what it's referring to, is that big Roman province that they had established in the southern part of Gaul, called Proincia or Gallia Narbonensis. Alterum Per Proincium Nostrum, that's saying the other route through our province. And here's the problem. So Julius Caesar does not want the Helvetii, this enormous number of people, to take a shortcut across Roman territory. And you can kind of see his point. Julius Caesar was not a good guy. He was a very ambitious guy. At best, you could describe him as power-hungry. He's considered a great man in the sense of important, but not necessarily the best example to follow. So I'm not saying that Julius Caesar is a great guy, but what I am saying is that you can kind of see his point that he doesn't want a huge you know, foreign tribe cutting across Roman territory. During the Roman Republic, as they accumulated more and more provinces outside of Rome, what would happen is that whenever someone served as consul, whenever someone was elected to the office of consul, they would serve that one-year term as consul, which is something like a president. And then after that, they would be assigned to a province to be in charge of a province in a title known as proconsul. We've talked about the preposition pro before. Pro means in place of or instead of. Proconsul means in the place of a consul. So you have a consular kind of power over that province. And that's what Julius Caesar is. He's the proconsul of Roman Gaul. Keep in mind that in ancient Rome, there was no separation between civilian and military. In the United States government, we have a very strict separation between civilian and military. But in ancient Rome, you did not. So in his post as proconsul, Julius Caesar had both civilian and military power and also judicial power because we read in Caesar's Gallic Wars of him going around running courts, uh, you know, they call it the assize courts. So in his role as proconsul, Caesar had judicial, military, and civilian administrative powers all rolled into one. So that being the case, if he's in charge of this big Roman province, you can understand why he would not want to have a huge number of people cutting across Roman territory. Probably the people who lived there depended on the Romans for their safety. And if you have a huge number of people flooding in, that could cause all kinds of problems. They could raid farms and cause all kinds of uh, havoc. Caesar is not a nice guy, but in this one particular instance, you can see why he would not want to have a huge number of people flooding in to the area that's his responsibility to look after. So, continuing on in the text, Caesar tells us more about this other road, this alterum iter. So, alterum per provinciam nostrum, through our province, and uh, we have the word facilius. That's a comparative adjective. It says easier, and then multo is a special kind of ablative called the ablative of degree of difference. It tells us how much of a difference there is between two things. You often see it with a comparative. So multo means by far. It's ablative singular, and again, that's called ablative of degree of difference. 
So Facilius and Multo together say, easier by far. Atque means and, and expeditius, well, that's yet another comparative. You can see from footnote one, expeditus, expedita, expeditum means free from obstacles or easy. And with the I-U-S ending, that's a comparative ending. These comparative adjectives are third declension adjectives of two terminations. So you have facilior for masculine and feminine, and then facilius is neuter. It looks masculine, but it's not. It's really a third declension neuter comparative form. Why is it neuter? Again, because it's agreeing with the idea of an iter, which again is a third declension neuter noun. So facilius means easier. That's a neuter comparative. And then expeditius means freer from obstacles. Again, that's a third declension neuter comparative. Multo facilius atque expeditius says something like easier by much and freer from obstacles. Next, we have propterea quod interfines helvetiorum et allobrogum. Propterea quod, those two words together mean something like on account of the fact that. Propter is a preposition that means on account of. It can also mean near. Propterea, I think, is some kind of, it's propter plus some kind of form of isaia id that's been through frequent use turned into some other kind of uh, preposition. Propterea and then quod says something like, on account of the fact that. And we need to look a little bit ahead to Rodanus and Fluit. Rodanus is the Rhone River. Fluit means flows. That's the verb fluo, third person singular present tense. So Rodanus Fluit says the Rhone River flows. And then back to the second line on this page, inter fines helvetiorum et allobrogum. So that's literally between the borders of the Helvetii and the borders of the Allobroges. We'll translate fines as territory. So the idea here is it's an easier road. It's much easier and more free of obstacles. Propterea quod, because of the fact that Rodanus fluit, the Rhone, flows between the territory of the Helvetii and the Allobroges. Then we have a relative clause. Qui nuper pacati errant. The qui is referring back to the allobroges. So it's talking about the allobroges who nuper pacati errant. Nuper is an adverb that means recently. And pacati errant is a compound tense of the verb paco. Paco is related to the noun pax, P A X. The idea is, uh, this is a very Roman kind of way to look at a word. Paco means to bring someone to peace in the sense of subduing them. So in the Roman mind, if you subdued or conquered a foreign tribe, you brought them to peace. That's a, a very imperialistic way to look at things. But during this time in Roman history, the Romans were still accumulating lots of uh, foreign provinces. The Romans had a strong sense of entitlement to be in charge of everything. They felt that they really deserved to be in control of the whole world. Very imperialistic. Pacati errant is passive and pluperfect, third person plural. So the idea with pacati errant is that they had been subdued So the idea here with this relative clause is that the allobroges, who had recently been subdued. Taking a look at our study helps page on the Lenny's Latin class website, take a look at that first map and you'll see that the allobroges inhabit the area just south of the Rhone River there. You can see the Jura Mountains 
and you can see Lake Geneva, you can see the territory of the Helvetii, and then just on the south side of the Rhone, that's where the Allobroges live. And then uh, it's even clearer on the second map, the one that looks like black and white. It has a helpful black line there showing the border around Gallia Narbonensis. The ancient Roman name for Lake Geneva was Limanus. So that's Lake Lemanus, or in modern parlance, Lake Geneva. And you can see that if you cross over the Rhone River as it flows out of the southwest side of Lake Geneva, you can see that if you cross south over the river, you're into Gallia Narbonensis. You're into Roman territory, specifically the region inhabited by the Allobroges. And if you go down to the third map, you'll see the colorful map that's mainly pink, you'll see that I've made a green dotted line there that shows the second route that was being discussed. In that particular route, they cut across the Rhone into Roman territory. So these are the two roads being discussed here. One road is the difficult one, that's the blue dotted line. That particular route stays on the north side of the Rhone River, it stays in non-Roman territory. So if the Helvetii were to take that road, it wouldn't really bother the Romans too much because they're not coming onto Roman territory. But if they cross over the Rhone from north to south and come into Gallia Narbonensis, well, now they're coming into Roman territory. And so if you're Julius Caesar and it's your job to look after that Roman territory, that could be perceived as a huge problem, even an invasion. So this is the heart of the conflict, is that the Helvetii don't want to take that difficult road. They want to cut across Roman territory and have a much easier route for their travels. But Julius Caesar does not want them to come onto Roman territory. That's really the heart of the problem. And it's easier to understand if you look at these maps and see exactly the, uh, you know, the geography that's involved. So why does Julius Caesar say that this other route is easier on account of the fact that the Rhone flows between the territory of the Helvetii and the Allobroges? Why does he say that? Well, we find out in the next sentence. It says, Isque non nullis locis vado transitur. And the idea here is that you can ford the Rhone River. It's shallow enough in some places that you can actually just wade across it or ford it. Transitur is the verb here. That's trans eo, which means to go across. It's passive, third person singular, present tense. So it's saying that the Rhone River, transitur, it is crossed, and then wado is an adverb that means by means of fording. Locis means in places. That's an ablative of place where. And then non nullis, we talked about that before. That means not none in the sense of some. So that's the Roman way to say some is to say non nullis, not none. So non nullis locis says. In some places, non nullis locis, wado, transitur. It is crossed in some places by fording. And we have uh, isque here. That's a form of is ea id, masculine, singular, nominative. And it's got the que ending. So it's is plus que saying something like and it. Is here is masculine. Even though we're translating it into English as it, it's masculine because it needs to agree grammatically with the grammatical gender of Rodanus. Rodanus is masculine, and so is is masculine too, to agree with Rodanus. So let's back up a little bit to the first line. It says, in reference to this other root, it says, easier by much and more free from obstacles on account of the fact that the Rhone River flows 
between the territory of the Helwetii and the Alobroges, who recently had been subdued. And then referring again to the Rhone River, it says, and it is crossed in some places by fording. This last sentence tells us a little bit more about the geography. It says, Extremum opidum alobrogum est proximumque helvetiorum finibus genawa. The subject of this last sentence here is Genawa. That's the name of a town in modern parlance. That would be Geneva. And so that's the subject. And we have the word est, meaning is. And then uh, what is it saying about Geneva? It's saying that it's the extremum opidum. Opidum means town. And extremum here means farthest, uh, the farthest away. In fact, if you look at the map again, you'll see that Ganawa is in the extreme upper right corner, or the northeast corner of Gallia Narbonensis. So extremum means uh, the furthest away, the farthest away. And uh, it's neuter to agree with opidum. Allobrogum is genitive plural. That's of the allobroges. That's the Gallic tribe known as the allobroges. You know, most of the other tribes have a plural with the letter I, like uh, Haidui, Helwetii, Sequani. But this tribe has apparently a name that's in the third declension. So Allobrogase with an ES at the end. And I'm pretty sure that the accent is on the anti penult. So Allobrogase is how I'm pronouncing it. So Extremum Opidum Allobrogum says the farthest town of the Allobroges. Proximumque means nearest. And the que ending supplies the word and. So and, it's the nearest. And then finibus is dative plural. It's nearest to the borders, Helwetiorum, of the Helwetii. So we'll translate finibus here as territory. And so this last sentence with Geneva as the subject, it says, Geneva is the farthest town of the Allobroges and the nearest to the territory of the Helwetii. And that brings us to the end of yet another installment of Lenny's Latin class. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next time in Lesson 59.